but what if um, something that you've walked through in your life and you're explaining it to me and I just simply, I know that I haven't walked through that journey, but I simply see the pain in your eyes. Could I relate to that? Because mm. I've had pain in my life. Right. Is it something in life where you have to walk through all of the different avenues of life to actually go, ah, now I know. Mm. I don't think that's right. I think we can actually say, man, I haven't walked your shoes. I haven't walked your life. But I see a similar thing in your eye that I had in mind when this happened. I know what pain feels like. I know what hurt feels like. So I mourn with you. We've got Luke with us from For King and Country. Yes. Thank you so much for dropping by our little cabin we have no, here. That's awesome. I brought my oldest boy because I said, hey, man, it's at a cabin. Let's go yeah. explore. And it feels like a little bit of a, an exploratory uh, mission to get here, which you is fun. You could do that. Yeah. It's fun. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you guys have a, um, a pretty close-knit family. What is, it, what is it that makes that work? How do you guys, or do you get, does it work? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was to bring back the curtain a little bit. Uh, no. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, not to harp on the same things, but uh, when we came to America, we didn't have anything. We were, mm -hmm. we were very, very poor. Um, we came from, you know, private schools in Australia to America where my mom was just so concerned about like, we're coming to, you know, America, what does this look like? And, and living in America and then the external, like when you live outside of America, what everybody portrays America to be, they're, they're two different things. And so we came in like, oh, there's just so, there's so much here, you know, how are we going to protect the kids from just becoming part of the culture, you know, how, so then we, we, we homeschooled mm -hmm. and, um, it was really through struggle that was, w th th it was the thing that bound us together. You know, my, um, my, uh, parents were very open about the fact that, you know, we got to go r rake and mow lawns to, to be able to provide enough food for the, the coming, not just weeks, but the coming week, you know, and hopefully mm -hmm. you can make, mow, mow enough lawns the next week to be able to, you know, you guys enough. literally didn't we did have that. anything. We didn't have anything. Yeah. yeah, we were renting a home. I mean, this this insane stories. When we moved out of that first home, the landlord called my dad and said, "Hey, you actually missed like four or five payments, but I didn't collect, and so it doesn't matter. You know, away you go." Wow. So there were just random. You know, we still don't know who paid for my little sister to be born in a hospital. We didn't have a car. Someone so we, anonymously gave paid us. For yeah, that. yeah, gave us money to. Wow. Actually, call up the hospital. My dad called to make the payment. And they said, hey, your payment's been paid in full. Praise you know, God. It was, it's insane stuff. You, uh, we went to Thanksgiving with a family. They gave us a car that day. Like, gave us a new car after we went to Thanksgiving. Wow. So, you know, when you... So then as you grow older and you start looking at family, family becomes pretty safe. They're the mm -hmm. people you actually turn to. Right. Um, and so for for... Joel and I, you know, we, we didn't necessarily get along that well growing up, but we were still each other's like, well, I wonder what Luke thinks of this. You know, uh, you know, I remember early days being married, I didn't have a job really. And my brother Ben would call me up. He's a video director and I would be his grip on all of these shoots. I wasn't qualified to be a grip, but he just trusted me to be, to show up, work hard, do the things that needed to be done. And so I think it's those, those early days of just being a family in an in a uncertain place, a family in a new country that uh, makes it to where they're, they're, they're the first ones you turn to, is family. I love that. That's good. It's what we should do, you know. Yeah. What have you learned in your relationship with your wife? What have I learned? You know, when I first was married, uh, early married, I, I, any crisis that took place I was like, so like, I've got to fix this. I've got to change. I've got to, th there's, there's obviously a problem here. And um, God kind of spoke to me. Yeah, there was, even in the last few years, uh, I would be praying for my wife and I'd be praying like, you know, God can, how do I handle this? And there were moments where I actually felt God just say, that's not for you to fix. Yeah. I, I got this mm. and let's just play it out. You know, let's just go on the, the journey together. There's not, we don't need to have a, an SOS thing where, you know, you, you know, I think for guys, you think, you know, there's this problem. I'm going to have this conversation. Everything's going to be well, way better. 
baked into your DNA yeah. as a guy, you got to fix everything. And yeah. I think that there was just like my wife prays for me in the moments where I'm out of line, and there's not necessarily a word that she can say or a speech that she can give that's going to make Luke, oh, he's going to become a better father now, mm-hmm. you know, because I had this. It's through relationship, you know. In some yeah. cases, it's 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 you know, I think hinging some of that on God, not just on the right speech or the right conversation or the right, you know, I'm going to confront this issue, <laughs> um, creates enough space for, for our spouses to be human, but understand that God is in the, is in a continual, in the continual business of refining. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect father, but I hope to be better tomorrow. Yeah. And I hope to be better the next day. And uh, I think that's something that kind of freed me up a little bit. If there's a problem, look, we're not going to avoid the problem, but it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that it's on to, you know, up to her or up to me to just to solve all of these issues. Let's right. go. Let's, we're on a journey together. I'm not leaving you. You're not leaving me. We're going to stick in it, and uh, let's go on a journey together. That's good. I, <laughs> it's funny whenever you know, my wife is sharing an issue or she's got a problem with a friend or whatever it is, it's so true. We try to fix that. And then the whole time when I'm trying to think of the right thing to say, because again, what am I trying to do? Yeah. yeah I'm trying of course. To, it's like, all right, God, give me the words. Lord, tell me what to say. Tell me what to do. Maybe I just need to zip it. <laughs> you know, and, and maybe that's something we well, all like, need to do. What, I think. One of the things that I realized pretty early on is um, usually the things that come to mind in the heat of the battle. Yeah. And not the things that should be said. That's true. And so sometimes my wife has actually said, why won't you just argue with me? Oh, wow. And I say, because it's not going to be good, honey. It's just not, it's not helpful for my soul. It's not helpful for yours. Yeah. And you're right. It doesn't, you know, maybe sometimes I should a little bit more. But, you know, yeah, I, I, I usually remain to the best of my ability yeah. quiet because it's just not usually very good. <laughs> it doesn't turn out well. It doesn't turn out well. <laughs> so talk about, you guys got a new song. Yeah. Relate. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, um, we had, I just actually listened to, I'm going to sound super spiritual, another awesome. sermon. And now, <laughs> Luke Smallboy. And, uh, and uh, the pastor was talking about compassion, and he was talking about Jesus. And he was saying, basically, I don't, I don't know if it's, Compassion isn't an emotion. I don't know, is it an attribute of somebody? Maybe it's an attribute. But it was talking about in the Bible, the attribute that was spoken about Jesus when confronted with a leper, Mm -hmm. a crowd, or um, a difficult situation. Uh, It usually says, I think it was said about him the most, that he he had immense compassion for them. And I was like, wow, what does it mean in today's day and age to like, you know, if we're following Jesus, we should act like Jesus. Yeah. So maybe we should write a song about this, you know. And what does it mean to have compassion for people? What does it mean to have, be empathetic? What does it mean to, in this day and age where, look, if you open up Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I mean, man, we're, we're killing our own out there. There's not a whole words. lot of compassion. There's not a whole lot of no, compassion. No, not at all. And it, it's been a, a little alarming to me. Yeah. You know, how... How in in, in 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 some cases it's inside the church. The church is obviously made up of sick people, so that, that's what we get. But mm-hmm. other people calling other people, you know, it's idiotic that you would say X, you know, or it's crazy that you would say Y. And I just, you know, I just it, it breaks it broke my heart. Mm. So the idea was, you know, what if I haven't walked your shoes, which is obviously true. Right. I've never done radio in my life. Uh, but what if um, something that you've walked through in your life? And you're explaining it to me. And I just simply, I know that I haven't walked through that journey, but I simply see the pain in your eyes. Could I relate to that? Because mm. I've had pain in my life. Right. Is it something in life where you have to walk through all of the different avenues of life to actually go, ah, now I know. Mm. I don't think that's right. I think we can actually say, man, I haven't walked your shoes. I haven't walked your life. But I see a similar thing in your eye that I had in mind when this happened. I know what pain feels like. I know what hurt feels like. So I mourn with you. Mm. I grieve with you because it looks like you've gone through something really, really difficult. If man, it's difficult to cast the stone at that point, yeah, you know, if you're if you're saying I see that hurt, 
And then, honestly, and then the and then the other thing goes. The other way it goes is, man, if somebody is, you know, writing that angry post, sure, and it's directed at you, right? You can actually say, oh, I know what that feels like. That must be coming from a place of hood as well. It gives you compassion for them. Right. It gives you grace for them. Yeah. It doesn't make you want to go, well, I'm going to show them in 90 words, you know. That's what we're doing, unfortunately. It's yeah. these, uh, I don't know if we're clearly thinking through what we're about to type out or what, but. Well, and we're faceless now. So you true. can say these things and it's just a name and, you know, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot there. there right? It's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know why we have to be so divisive, um, but I love what you're saying. Find something or some way that you can relate to someone, that you can see something. And I think it's this, that we've forgotten we're all humans. Yeah. That that, that person that made you angry is a real person, and God yeah. loves them. Yeah. And they have, we just, maybe that's it. We don't know that we can relate. We don't understand. And so anybody that you don't understand, it's not worth your time, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. That's a sad commentary, but... Uh, and I look, and, you know, you hope... Yeah, I think as artists, you know, I think our job is, is uh, to prick the hearts of people. Mm-hmm. Because a song and a melody makes the medicine go down a little bit better. You True. True. And so, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important thing for people in any, you know, in any form of influence to, to not shy away from hard topics. Right. To not shy away from, from difficult things. Uh, you know, God has given people giftings and talents to be able to, to address difficult issues. Right. Um, and versus, you know, shying away, I, th- I think that we've got to do a little bit better a job of of leaning in. And look, I'm not saying our song solves the problem, but I hope people right. hear it and, and say, you know, at the end of the song, it says, by the grace of God, you know, we'll see each other's hearts. Can you relate? And that's, I think that's the hope is that we'll be able to um, calm that anger a little bit, you yeah. know, step back a little bit and, uh, and be able to ask the question, you know what? Yeah, maybe I can relate to that person, though I haven't walked their, their journey. Gotcha. Let's talk Australia. Okay. And... Uh, versus uh, the typical language we know. I know you have phrases and things yeah. that you use we yeah. don't use. Yeah. Educate me on some of these awesome things that you guys say. Yeah, well, I, one of the... the uh, just It's just the funniest... It's just a funny-sounding word. is a word uh, that is... It said fair dinkum. It's, it's a phrase that people use in Australia. It's called okay. fair dinkum. And basically, it's another way of saying, are you serious? Fair dinkum. Fair dinkum. Huh? That's and cool. it's always one when I was young. I heard people say it, and then I realized, obviously, over here, you know, nobody says fair income. <laughs> and, uh, and it was one that always, I think, it, you know, coming from a homeschool family, it also made me sound educated, you yeah. know, fair income, you know. They must have said it in, you know, uh, England as well, because uh, that's where we, we came from. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, that's one word that is unique. What else that, you got? What else have I got? Um, uh, I need my brother. <laughs> Uh, Bro, fair income is probably the most obvious. I mean, there's there's all sorts of you know slang. Obviously, crocodile hunter made crikey right. famous. Yep. And everybody's like, "What is crikey?" And I was like, "You tell me." It's basically just like, "Oh man, crazy, <laughs> crikey," <laughs> you know? Because I don't know where it originates. Right. I'm the, I have you know I I wonder if I could look it up. Is it in the dictionary? I don't even know. But that's another you know kind of famous one that, that that our favorite man the crocodile hunter made famous what's what are some of the differences culturally well we we don't take ourselves all that seriously okay. in australia and there's a, and, and everybody's very very laid back i mean look australians are just very very kind people everyone i mean not, not obviously 100% but every everybody's just kind of like you need a hand they'll come they'll come and help you um there's an immense amount of, they love to laugh, mm. you know, they love to have a good time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I read somewhere that, you know, Australians are, are some of the hardest working people in the world. And I was like, well, that's cool. But I don't see many Australians being that efficient with their time because they want a great conversation. Ah, uh, They gotcha. want a great, they want to be able to, you could work 10 hours, but did they actually really put sure. in 10 hours of work? I don't know. But they're, they're, they're just, um, 
jolly good folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of refreshing to go back. You know, we only, well, there's only about 5% Christian uh, uh-huh. in Australia. That, that, that's attend church, so that's a really? relative term. Wow. Um, so we're very post-Christian. Um, and part of even going back to, you know, the circle of back to what we were talking about earlier, I mean, we're a successful country. We're a mm-hmm. successful economy. We don't have many people. There's about 24 million people in Australia. Um, and we don't need God. Mm, I think most people, that's what they, I mean, my life's great. Right. You know? Um, and so, yeah, we have, we have very few people that are uh, churched. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad thing. That's interesting. So you guys have some movies yeah. that you're involved in. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, so we did a movie, was it in 16, 2016 or 17, somewhere in there, um, called Priceless. Right. That uh, was surrounded around the song. And, uh, you know, it was the most complicated thing we've ever done. It was incredibly stressful. Um, Enjoyable is even a stretch. It was really? just really hot. The whole step is just, you know. And you guys it, have a new, like a new one too. Yeah, well, well, that's the, well, so we sat back and we're like, this was really hard. Why? And should we ever do this again? <laughs> and I, one of the things I said was, is, well, I think you're foolish not to put into action the lessons you learned from one of the most difficult things you ever did. Right. And that was that, was that movie. And so, um, We've been working on a, a, a couple movies. We have a, an, another movie called um, uh, Drummer Boy, which is about a little drummer boy who uh, is raised in a Civil War era, ends up on opposite sides of the battlefield with his brother, mm. and just kind of that story. But that's been put on hold for a second. And then we have another um, movie that is is getting close to probably being shot, and that is uh, a movie called Unsung Hero. It's actually about kind of our, our mother mm. and her story, which is obviously about us, Coming to America, hmm. kind of what we talked about early, earlier, and um, I'm intrigued by by that because most people, you know, think of uh, our father, who's a pretty verbose man. Uh, our sister is a, an artist, and um, they think of, you know, well, you should if you're going to do a movie, it should be about through the lens of, you know, maybe some of that. But it's our mother who kept everybody together. Hmm. It's our mother who did all the the things that nobody sees. And so that, that movie currently is in development, and it's called Unsung Hero. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it all pans out, but uh, we're, we're excited about it. That's cool. What is, uh, what is bringing you joy these days? What is bringing me joy? I think I've been much more contemplative over the last... Um, I think the pandemic has actually made me more contemplative. Yeah. And... It's not necessarily the contemplation that has made me more joyful. It has been probably the ramifications of the contemplation. And what I mean by that is um, we, uh, we've lived a very, very hurried, busy life. Uh, I think most of us do, but m- me particularly. And, you know, I've walked through some random stuff over the, you know, ironically enough, since I've started music, my life got really complicated (laughs) and not just because of music. You know, I had some health issues. My wife walked through some things. I nearly lost uh, my youngest son. Uh, You know, there's been, you know, tons of these bumps. Yeah. And I think the thing that has brought me joy is, is actually wrestling with, with, um, faith in those difficult journeys because when when we go through a pandemic fear is natural mm-hmm. you're going to go through fear and if you stay fearful it's going to it's going to bring up an awful amount of anxiety it's going to be bring up an awful amount of worry so what do you do right yeah. what do you do with that and uh i think some of the things that have have come back to me over the last year is that I have, I have not been a praying man to the, way, to the level that I think produces joy. Yeah. And in my struggles uh, of the last decade, it's when, my, it's when I've been like casting all of those concerns onto someone who's far greater than my, than my onto their shoulders, uh, I find great joy. Mm. I found great peace. You know, in the moments of, of, of deep deep anguish those are where i pray honest prayers mm. those are when i pray true prayers and the moments that follow that are the moments that i have i feel invincible 
Mm. God, if you want, you want to take me, you could take me. Yeah. And so I think the thing that gives me, brings me great joy is those moments. Those, and they don't happen always. But my, my hope is, is to live a life in the coming years filled in that, that space a lot more. I've been, re- been reading a biography on <laughs> Billy Graham, and I've read tons of biographies on him, so I don't know why I'm reading another, but I am. And in there, they, uh, they asked Billy as an old man, you know, what are some of your regrets? And he said that he was too busy, mm. um, which regretted not being able to spend more time with his family, which I think everybody would, would look at his life and say, you are very busy. Um, and he said, you know, I, I didn't spend enough time in prayer and scripture, mm. and I regret that. Well, it followed up in the commentary that maybe this was old, in his older you know, age, that he would spend six, six hours a day in prayer and scripture. Wow. And he still said... He didn't do enough. I, didn't, I, I regret not spending more time. Wow. So it's things like that that, you know, and I, it's a, a, a weird way to come back to brings me joy. I think that those, those are the difficult things in this society to do yeah. that are the things that have the greatest reward. And when I do them, I have great joy. Yeah, that's good. Amen. What do you struggle with? What do I struggle with? I mean, too many or is, things. <laughs> or is there an inner... No. Like, most people have sort of a, like an inner angst about something. I don't want to fail. I don't yeah. want to... I, I, um, and at the end of the day, as I've probably been more contemplative over the last year and a half, my fear of failure is pride. Mm. I have too much pride. I, I care... I don't necessarily care about what other people think but I, I don't want to waste my life. Mm. And so sadly, I think I, I live my life not from the place of grace. Yeah. I live my life to achieve grace, Ooh, and it's backwards. Good. Yeah, Oh, I like that. And so I, I, yeah. I think those... And look, <laughs> what do I struggle with? The list goes on from there. I mean, yeah. that, that, those are, you know... It's like Reaganomics, right? <laughs> Sin has a way of trickling down into a lot of different ways. You're right. You know, how do I handle yeah. money? We're all rich. Sure. You know, you got all this stuff going on in, in Afghanistan and Haiti, which we haven't really even spoken about that much, just because it's been overshadowed. I mean, I mean, wow. How, what do I? What do I do with this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, when you talk about the rich man getting through the eye of the needle, you know, right. or the camel going, it's easier for uh, you know. A, a camel to get through the, the needle than the, the rich man. America is rich. We are every single one. Of, I think I said. I think I, I I heard that if you own a vehicle, you're in the 99 percentile of the world. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Yeah. So it's the, the these are the things that I re- I wrestle with. And you know I think that you know I, I, as I as I um, read scripture, obviously there's things that are very convicting, and there's things that I don't fully understand. Um, but I hinge my life on it, and I, uh, I, I believe it to be God's word, and I'm going to struggle through with it. You know, mm. that's going to be my place to turn, hopefully for wisdom. And but uh, look, I got a bunch of issues. We could probably spend the whole podcast talking <laughs> about issues. But yeah, and now it's time for yeah. Luke's issues. Yeah, Luke's issues <laughs> number two. We're going to go on to several thousand. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's talk about one issue you had. You, during this pandemic, had surgery. I did. What yeah. was that like? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I've sung for my whole life. Never really had any vocal issues. And uh, I, ironically enough, when the pandemic started in March, over the next few months, I started to have some issues. I wasn't doing shows. Right. <laughs> so I was talking too much, too loud. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, Doing, doing a lot of you know uh, Zoom calls and and interviews that way and and so I got myself into a little bit of a pickle, and I, I was having issues and uh, and I was having to push more and more and so I was creating more and more damage. And then I never had any of this, these issues before, so I was like oh, I don't know what to do. Well, one day I was doing a a interview in at my house, and Joel was with me, and he said, "Man, your your voice sounds weird. You should go get that checked out." Mm. And I. Uh, I knew he was right. I knew he was telling the truth. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to go. So anyway, I go, I go sit down and, and I'm talking to the therapist lady. And, and she's like, well, you, you talk fine. I wouldn't have thought that you, know, you had an issue. So they go and they put a camera in your throat. And 
I had this, the, the best way to explain it to common people is a blood blister on your vocal cord, which is oh. not, not something you want. That doesn't sound and good. And they call it a polyp. Right. But as, at the end of the day, it's basically a blood blister. And they were like, oh, well, you've got to go on vocal rest for however long. And so I've done about a month of silence in the last year. And uh, I uh, was getting better, went and did Christmas shows, fall shows, and, and was feeling good. And once again, I come back to being quiet again, mm -hmm. or seemingly. And I'm doing calls, and I'm doing all this stuff. And I go in kind of for a checkup, and it was back again, the blood blister. And, uh, and so they said, well, when it happens this frequently, you, you got to go get it chopped off. And so uh, I made the decision to go get the surgery. And, and look, I, I felt really good um, going into it. Um, I did have some people say, well, you know, go get a surgery, you know, surgery on your vocal cords. It, it can mess up and, you know, you may not be able to do what you do. Was that a fear or, you know, kind of going in? Uh-oh. What's... I had people bring it to me. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks a lot, ba everybody. Bad friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, Is this similar to what Matthew West was dealing with? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He had a, a different issue, but similar. Yeah. Of uh, the same nature. And so um, it was in the five days after surgery, you can't talk at all. You can't make it. I mean, if you can avoid a cough, you can avoid a sneeze. You so don't you're just not make, supposed to. Or well, you can't. Or you're not able to. I mean, I didn't try. Okay. But you're not meant to. You're not supposed you're not, to. Yeah, not yeah. supposed to. And, uh, and it was in those moments where it's like, well, what if, what if I can't, yeah. what if I can't talk anymore? You know, what if I can't make, I mean, you'd be able to make some noise. It just may not be pretty. Right. And I was like, well, what if I can't do these things that I feel currently that I'm meant to do? And then it went a little further and then it was like, well, is my identity wrapped up in this now? Like, do I need this? Mm -hmm. Like, do you need this? Right. I think it's good for, for people in, especially in occupations where, you're in front of people and there's a degree of influence to, to ask yourself the question of, is this about calling and, and purpose or is this actually the thing that's feeding your ego? Mm. And so those were the questions that I was asking in my silence. And I felt God really clearly say to me, is like, man, Luke, don't you get it by now? You know, it's never been about what you could do for me. You know, it's mm. never been about a song or, or a song that, you know, or it's never been about the mistakes you've made. Or the, the things that have gone well for you in the past. It's never been about what you could or couldn't achieve in the years to come. You know, it's, it's the fact that I love you, I love you, I love you. Mm. And that's when I even, you know, even earlier when I talked about living from a position of grace versus trying to achieve it. I think that's going to be a lifelong struggle for me. Because it was, it was a similar lesson that I think I learned years ago, which was it's not about what I can achieve or what I can do. Yeah. Um, that's already been done for. Um, and man, I tell you what, once again, in those honest prayers and that, those five days of silence, man, I felt, I was like, God, man, take my voice then. Mm. Yeah, you can, if you want that, right. I'll th you'll have something else for me to do. Right. You know, um, and you'd provide for me. You feel this sense of the peace that we read about. Sure. You, you actually, I actually had it for a, a, a second. <laughs> It lasted a little while. Yeah. <laughs> Probably until I started talking again. <laughs> <laughs> totally get that. Uh, That's totally true. Man, thanks for, for hanging with us today. We really appreciate it. Man. I'm glad we, we, go, we go back a few years we now. Do. Yeah. We do. I've, I mean, always, I've always enjoyed our time together. And you know what? I'm, I'm glad I got to hang out with the best brother. And, ah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where's, yeah. the other, where's Josh's yeah. in there? So. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it. Always appreciate your friendship and, and your kindness and your... your um, your spiritual intent to take people mm -hmm. from one place to another. I, I always look really at important. it like this. What, what can we do today together that will help someone? It's all about helping somebody. And hopefully I, I there's a lot of selfish reasons. I want to be helped. Yeah. You know, and if you've learned something that could help me, then years ago, good. Uh, in closing, my dad, um, I, I was on a basketball team and, and I, one of these guys that was playing on the team was a unique guy. He'd come from a little bit of a troubled background. And I worked, you know, basically from when I was very young. And so I would get paid. So I was always a guy that people were like, oh, there's money bags, Luke. You know, because I was always busy. And, and you know, money bags being having $1,000 in the bank account at 16. Not much. But, you know, sure. that's what people were like. Well, this guy is crazy. Well, way to go. So you what saved $1,000. There you go. Well, that's right. Yeah. So, but anyway, this guy comes to me and he goes, hey, I need, I need, to, buy, I, I need to borrow $70. I was like, $70? What do you need to borrow, borrow $70 for? He said, I got this phone bill. 
And I was like, you have family. Why are you coming to me? <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, I, I was, so I, I didn't know what to do. And so I went to my dad and I said, dad, you know, what do you, what do, you do? You know, you hear all these stories of don't lend money to your friends because they'll never pay you back, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know if dad took it all that seriously, the, the conversation. He just literally was like busy with something and he goes, well, you know, if, if you can help someone, you just do it. Wow. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that to heart. It, it, he doesn't even, he won't even remember he said that. Wow. But it was, it was like, well, if you can't pay me back, so be it. If you can help someone, do it. I don't know that you would expect that answer to come from a parent. So that was a different way of yeah. maybe Jesus' way of looking at it. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully that's helpful to us all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you. Always. Yeah.